Hey everyone, welcome to the Lead Generation World Podcast. My name is Michael Fareed. Thanks for joining me again. Uh, we've got our UK edition. We've got Simon Delaney from Data Bowl joining us here in just a moment. So uh, look forward to chatting with Simon about what's going on in the Legion world over there in the UK. Um, obviously, this leading up to um, our London conference, Lead Generation World London, which is taking place uh, April 12th and 13th, uh, 2021. Registration is open. Um, we are working towards having an in-person conference following all guidelines, assuming things go, uh, start to improve. Um, so it's all guaranteed. So if for some reason the conference doesn't take place or turns into a virtual conference or just changes in general, um, you can uh, get a refund. So there's no risk. Best thing to do right now is to register now and get the lowest price available. Um, and save yourself a couple bucks uh, since it's fully guaranteed. So uh, anyways, uh, let's go ahead and bring Simon into the show and start talking a little shop. All right. Welcome to the Lead Generation World Podcast. My name's Mike. Thanks for uh, joining me today. We've got uh, Simon Delaney here from Data Bowl over there uh, across the pond, as they say in the UK. Where, where exactly are you located? Uh, in Sheffield, in the north of England. Got it. Got it. Um, and, uh, you were saying that it's, um, the rain's coming down obviously today, uh, today there, or it's been raining. Yeah. For the last week, I think it's been raining. Um, so yes, yeah, not they, a big surprise, right? What well, it's global warming sort of <laughs> changing it slightly, but, um, yeah, yeah. Under COVID conditions, you know, it's fine. Like we were saying when the sun's shining, but it's, it makes it more difficult when it's, uh, raining. Definitely. Yeah, and we'll we'll get into that. Uh, but I do want to first sort of get to know you a little bit. Um, sure. And so, uh, tell me a little bit about how you sort of initially got into qu the quote unquote lead generation uh, industry or or business, and how you sort of you know what was your first entry point into the performance marketing world. So, <clears throat> I started in the lead gen world. I think it was about two thousand and five, something like that. It was quite a long time ago, um, and. I went to work for a company at the time. So I'd always worked in the sort of marketing or sales capacity, but in a few different industries. Um, so in my mid twenties, I think I started at a company that subsequently got bought out by a, a huge corporation. Um, and we were doing um, landing page leads, solace emails and stuff like that and co-registration. It was a whole gambit of B2C lead generation. Um, when I look back on it now, it's actually an incredible place to learn lead generation because um, I've, I think you've worked in lead gen a similar amount of time, but back in the day, it was like a different world, like the access to clients, um, the sort of stuff that used to work on the money that was in there and the ease of it because it was still relatively new, especially online lead generation at the time. Um, so yeah, it was a really, really good uh, place to learn all about lead generation. So I worked. I, I was actually talking about this the other day with just on LinkedIn. It was just a few comments of us, uh, a couple of guys I used to work with commented on a post I'd put on, and um, we were talking to each other about what an amazing breeding ground it was because a lot of the people that all work there at a similar time have stayed in the industry and gone on to like set their own companies up and um, do different yeah. things. Um, well, let me, let me ask you this. I mean, you know, yeah. back then 2005, um, which I mean, in internet years is like, a you know, a century ago, right? I mean, it's, it, yeah. there's so much development that happens in a short term, uh, period of time, um, in the online world. And, but, but when you look at Legion sort of back then, um, how do you see it? How, how, how has it sort of changed from 2005 to, you know, to, uh, uh 2020? Um, but has it changed at all? Or is it the same? No, yeah, it's changed, but it's, I think the only thing that's really changed, so obviously it's got like slightly more professional. So for example, we do a lot, build a lot of landing pages for people. So loads of science goes into that and thinking about, you know, the psychological impact when someone sees a page and what's going to make them convert and things like that. Um, whereas back then you didn't really think about it. It was just like whether it looked good or not. And 99% of the time it didn't even look good anyway. <laughs> um, yeah. but, um, it's still, it's not really changed in the sense that it's all been about getting people to view things and click on things and then convert. Right. I mean, 
that's ultimately been the name of the game. But so back from when we started, so when you look at 2005, 2006, Facebook was an entity. But it, I mean, it was like, wasn't used. I remember someone contacting me and saying, um, you can buy Facebook as a list. And I'll send you, send me like five grand or whatever, and I'll send you a list of, I think they were talking crap at the time, right? But yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that was the world that everyone lived in. It'd be like lists of data. So if, you want, if you've got a campaign, you want to send it to a big list, either on a CPM or a CPC or whatever. Um, so ultimately, the, the actual aim of lead generation specifically has not really changed. It's all been about getting views, getting clicks, getting leads, and sending them off to clients. Some of the technology has changed. Um, but I mean, because I, we work in technology, I, you wouldn't even think that it changed for a lot of people. It's still 2005, and even before for a lot of people, uh, you know, when I speak to them and look at the systems they're using. Um, and I think that it's probably a lot more accessible now than it used to be. So um, back in 2005, unless you've got a job in it, it's highly unlikely you'd work in lead generation now, right? But yeah. now you can have like a guy sat in his bedroom who um, is on his own generating for leads for companies all over the world, building pages, driving traffic on Facebook or PPC and sending them to him. So I think, yeah, accessibility, um, because it's the internet exactly like you said, and it's moved on um, a lot in that time, the, all the knowledge is there, so you can sort of go online and get it and things. But, it, yeah. you know, being a media buyer is the key now. I mean... You know, back in the day, it wasn't. It was all about relationships and knowing publishers and affiliates and people who could drive traffic and things. Now, you just need to now to buy traffic. Yeah. Now, it's interesting because, uh, well, w one thing I just make point of, you know, I, I, the most people I talked to sort of fell into lead generation, right? They, they, were, they obviously didn't graduate from the university or whatever and go, I'm getting into lead gen or performance marketing. Somehow they sort of fell into it, which is sort of, you know, interesting. But um and to to your to most recent point, it, um, now you're what is are you trying to say that you know most people are focused on driving uh, their own traffic versus um, maybe buying buying leads? Is that what is that what you're saying? Uh, not necessarily. It's still both because you get brokers and agencies that will buy leads um, and drive them. But the it's just because you know ninety nine percent of the traffic outside of like affiliate networks. But I mean most of the traffic. Before that, all comes from two places. It's all Facebook and Google. It's like a monopoly on the eyes of the world that you're going to drive traffic to. Um, yeah. So the, that's why I was talking about media buyers. Because if you're if you're trained in media buying or you're used to it, you've done PPC or um, you've been driving Facebook traffic. That's really how you like you'd start in lead generation because you'd probably you might have been working on a retainer either independently or with an agency. Then you start thinking about building your own assets and rather than moving into e-commerce or doing it like on a pure um, sale basis, you start generating leads and then realize the revenue that can be made from that. Um, yeah, just to answer your point, I, yeah, I fell into lead gen. I mean, it was just, <laughs> you know, it was a job at the time and it was like, this sounds interesting. Let's go and see what it's about. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, okay. So now fast forward to Datable. I mean, now you're, yeah. you're, you're still doing, you know, some landing page, but it's more inclusive of a lot of other uh, services. Tell, tell us a little bit of, uh, about Datable. Yeah. So Datable itself doesn't do any lead generation. We just provide right. the services that companies can uh, use the software to generate leads. So um, that was actually always a dream. So after I'd started it um, back in 2005, um, it was always looking at the systems that were being used. So back then we were still APIing leads out and things, but it always be hand coded by like a developer. So we'd get the details and go and do it. And then we had like a rudimentary system that we'd use. But it was really obvious even back then um, that if you could get the technology right and um, start allowing people to actually interact with it, um, it, it's actually the key to lead generation. So even though it's like media buying and stuff, it's still... It's, this, it's, all, it's very technology driven. It's not like another industry where you can actually remove the technology. It's almost impossible. You have to have it. Um, but yeah, so we started developing software um, and the ultimate dream was always the, to turn um, lead generators into brands and to turn brands into lead generators. By that, I mean, um, you know, there's companies like MVF Global and Container Media and Do Lead. Um, and they're massive lead generators all over the world, right? So they're live in like 20 countries or something. But they, what they actually do, if you watch it, they create their own brands and the consumer or the, 
prospects or the people out in Facebook and PPC see that as the brand that they interact with and then those leads get sold. So, and these brands don't even know that's happening. So it's like they're slowly getting sort of cannibalized by their own lead generators. It's great for the lead generator, right? And it's the way that you create a brand and um, it's ultimately what comparison sites are about, but they do it on a sale rather than for lead. And then for the brands, um, how can we help them turn into lead generators and become better at lead generation and sort of interacting with people um, filling their sales pipeline? So, um, well, let's start at the top of the pipeline. I mean, how does Datable help fill the pipeline? You, you said you're not, uh, you know, necessarily, you know, buying media or generating leads. How does that, um, how do you guys help with that at the top? So you can build landing pages in Datable, for example. Um, we've got full affiliate tracking in there. Um, and then we've got a um, whole lead distribution suite. So the idea is that you work on driving the traffic, whether that's Facebook, PPC, um, yeah affiliate networks, and then we do all the other bit in the middle. So all you need to do is deliver it to a sales pipeline. So whether that's a, um, a CRM, a dialer, uh, an ESP, or something else. And then you can nurture leads and data balls also. We send emails and SMS out. Um, so what it really means is that someone who licenses or a company that licenses data ball, all they need to focus on is the traffic and the clients or the sales. Um, and we cover the whole bit in the middle without having to license lots of different software. That's really what it's about. Do your client back to, you just sort of uh, touched on, you know, the call center aspect of, of potentially, yeah. you know, the leads go, coming into Datable, going out to maybe a dialer, coming back potentially from the dialer, going into a nurturing system. Does that communication mm -hmm. work pretty seamlessly and do your clients util, utilize that frequently or are those just more sophisticated uh, companies that sort of, are able to go back and forth and, and utilize both. Yeah, we sort of get a mix of both. So you'll work with um, some diet. It's all to do with the dialer technology. And I suppose the appetite of the individuals operating the dialer technology. But yeah, some do that. So they um, have leads driving in, go straight into a call center. Whatever the disposition is, they fire it back up to Datable. And then normally if it isn't, a, we've got a DMC, like a decision maker contact them and spoken to them. Then you start this uh, nurturing sequence. So it could be you send them an SMS to say, like, we just tried to call, when's the best time to call? And then whatever they answer, you can actually append that to the lead and deliver that on a schedule via an API. Um, and then you might start sending emails. And then I think this is why it works well if you're lead generators and you're creating brands, because then you start setting campaigns up in other verticals and um, emailing them other offers, depending on what the outcome is on one offer and stuff like that. But if I, I mean, being completely honest, um, you, I, we get sort of three users. So ones that just see that immediately and go, wow, what an opportunity. We're just going to bed that straight in. Another that knows the opportunity is there, but just says, no, either can't be bothered or don't believe in it or something. Then you get the others which are, oh, we really want to do that. But either due to the technology we're feeding into or the appetite of several people there, they just never happens. Um, so I've seen all of it. I mean, it's, you know, and every day you get, one or the other. Yeah, no, I get it. And we, I mean, obviously it's, you know, worldwide with brands and companies and their sophistication with IT and how they can integrate and integrate with their other, you know, third party platforms and different things that they use become, you know, problematic. And some companies see it and can identify and implement it easily. And some just never can, unfortunately, you know, do you find yeah. that, um, I always sort of, one thing I've, I've, you know, for the last year or so, I've been, you know, talking to a lot of individuals over there in the UK about lead generation. Um, and, and one of the focuses that, you know, we have at Lead Generation World is, is really talking about the full funnel, right? It's not just about generating leads or buying leads, whatever it is. It's also about what do you do, you know, after you, that, you, that lead is generated? <clears throat> uh, how soon do you call it? The nurturing and bringing brands in and educating them on how to um, work those leads effectively because obviously if, if they can't be effective with leads, lead generators aren't going to be successful period. Right. So at the core, the base is the success of these brands and lead buyers with what they do after the lead. So I, me being a, a, an old lead buyer, I have sort of an affinity for, for educating and building on from that basis up. Um, yeah. 
but uh, do you find, so I'm always kind of curious where um, you, you see, you know, brands sophistication with lead management. I mean, it, this, even here in the U.S., there's always more to learn and more to, you know, gain on, um, on implementing best practices around lead management. Where do you sort of see it there in the UK, uh, the development, are brands starting to, or lead buyers starting to really attach themselves and be educated on the best practices around, you know, uh, working leads? Not, not, I mean, they, they, it's slowly happening, but it's taken a long, long, long time. I mean, it's still, I find it incredible. So it's, it's like people don't know what's best for them. It's just incredible why like there's some of the, some of the stuff that you see. Um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's the ultimate frustration, isn't it? It's just, no matter how good a lead is, it's only ever as good as the thing that you're sending it to. Um, and if they're not going to call it like 24, 48 hours, you know, you may as well not call it at all. A 20, um, well, I mean, within the first few minutes, right? I mean, really, if they're not calling it, you know, the, 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 the success yeah, of a lead is exactly. Go. Oh, I mean, well, I, I say it should be like five seconds, right? Yeah, I mean, it's like, it yeah. should be like that. Yeah. Um, but it, the, the problem that happens is, and it all depends on the brand, right? Because ultimately, whoever's paying the bills for anything to happen can always make it happen. Because, you know, they're just going to find a way. The m money always talks and you can make anyone do like you know, any technology or any systems or anything. Um, but that, like, I, it comes back to what you just said. It has to be the brand that like follows this. So, we work with some brands and they get it like that, you know, and they're the ones really pushing going, I, you know, we've got to get these leads called. We've got to do this. We've got to put them in this nurturing funnel. We've got to have this like real time interaction and things. Um, and there's others that just don't get it. And I think ultimately what it comes down to is, uh, it's, it's where they put the priority, I think. So it, you usually see it in the UK and I don't know if it's like it in the U S um, when the sales are actually outsourced. So if you're outsourcing the sales, the sales entity, and so it's all good, right? I mean, it's a good thing to do. But what they want to be seen as is like doing the right thing and they're the ones that are actually driving the campaigns. The, the, they see like all the CPA that's being used to drive sales is being sitting with them. And so what happens is they see like data just as a secondary thing it's like a nice to have you know you sort of need it but you don't want it it's a bit like having an appendix it's just there and it just somehow does something um but the ones i think that get it the most are the brands that realize it's the data that makes the difference so yes you need like high quality agents you just don't need very many of them and you just need to make them dial leads immediately and then when they don't get hold of people you need to have like a marketing sense and that's the other problem it comes back to i i I mean, nobody, I don't get that many uh, views on LinkedIn. I talk about it endlessly. So there's two things. So one is, um, yeah, the priority of the CPA and where you put it. Mm -hmm. um, so is it on leads or is it in the actual sales that are being made? But the other is that in brands, and you will see this everywhere, the marketing and the sales department are completely siloed. They have their own budgets. They have their own sort of things that they're trying to achieve. And they're just, you know, they don't even meet at all. Um, and that really kills the post sales opportunity of the lead generation. So it goes into a dialer, they try and dial it, they try and dial it five times, they can't get whatever, however many times it is. The sale doesn't happen, oh, she's gone. That's it, never to be heard of it ever again. And in reality, this individual might just not want to switch, like whatever they're doing. So uh, it could be switch broadband, switch mobile phone supply, whatever it is, cell phone supply. Um, and so, you, you know, until you sort of get these silos removed and actually have the sales and the marketing work together um, and actually invest quite a lot or a significant amount of this CPA into the actual people that you're wanting to sell to, not just the entity that is going to sell to them, um, it's always going to be a problem because that's, that's really what lead gen is all about. Yeah, I mean, you said a lot of things there. I'd love to uh, comment on I mean, like, you know... Uh, I think a lot of companies, you know, f do that first effort, right? That certain amount of calls and then sort of, okay, this didn't work on to the next one. It's like a churn and burn type of mentality. Um, but I think the smart companies, to your point, you know, build out a, a process that takes into account the consumer versus just how do I get the fastest sale and move on to the next one? Because consumers, like you said, I mean, listen, if it's a, 
a remortgage, a big, something big like that, or a cell phone, whatever, you know, they may have been looking that night, but you know, now they're getting phone calls. They don't want to answer them, whatever, but they, that doesn't mean there's not in the, uh, you know, still in the shopping mode or comparison mode and calling them maybe a week later or sending them a text message or an email or something to that effect. And having a built out process is, is really important for the long run, I would imagine, right? Because it doesn't just, you know, I, I think I saw something on LinkedIn with you where uh, you mentioned, you know, where's, where's the end point of lead generation, right? Is it at the point of a lead or is it at the sale or, you know, where is it and how do you build out a process uh, to accommodate that? Because the answer is it doesn't end at, at the exactly. lead. Exactly. Right? It doesn't end. It doesn't, it doesn't ever actually, it never ends in reality. Yeah. So I mean, until they tell you to stop calling, <laughs> but, yeah. you know, but yeah. So yeah. I say, yeah, no, get off me sort of thing. But um, yeah, and I think that's why it sort of comes back to the point of why lead generators could start thinking as brands, right? Because if you're a lead generator, you can do this marketing that's being missed because virtually everyone that's buying leads, if they're a brand, is all the sales side. And so the marketing side, which is actually where the relationship's built with the individual, because the sales, like the end point effectively of the marketing, the lead gen is marketing, right? But if you're, you then have this marketing opportunity where you become the one who is nurturing the lead, you're the one who's in contact, you're the one that they learn to trust, you're the one with the relationship, um, that actually becomes the brand that that individual knows. So then this, the sales opportunity, all you do is switch verticals and it's you that are creating the sales into the verticals, not the brand. And that's actually just because the brands are marketing. Literally, yeah. that's all that has to happen. It's, me. it's incredible when you think of it. And it, you know, it's one of those things where we're talking about it now and in 10 years, five years, whatever, it might change. But right now, I, I'd love you to show me a single brand over a certain size that combines sales and marketing. They just don't do it. Yeah, that's, that's a really good, uh, interesting point because, um, you know, if you look at, if I look at um, lead gen evolution sort of here, and I think everywhere, it was um, how do you generate a lead, right? So a data lead, someone filled out a form to some extent, uh, raised their hand and said, okay, I, I want this product and it goes. But then uh, lead generators had the problem that we've sort of been discussing is they were selling leads to brands or companies that weren't calling them, right? That weren't mm. following up, but then we're coming back to them and complaining, hey, these leads are horrible. Well, not necessarily, you're, you're just not doing the, you know, the job of calling them and following up with them. So then lead generators started calling them themselves, right? And then selling, you know, hot transfers or transfers or calls, yeah. right? And they started doing that on their own. And now there's actually a, a good, I mean, I think this, there's probably more than one, but I think of an example here in the US of a company called EverQuote. And EverQuote um, wouldn't even say that they're a lead generator, which they are. They generate lead, millions of leads of auto insurance uh, leads. Um, and I think mm -hmm. other, other ones, but their process is very consumer centric in that it's not just about um, creating a data lead. Uh, they really provide options. They follow up with them via email. Did this work? You know, and then here, you know, it's very, um, you get into a funnel. It's not just, oh, they filled out the form. See you later they still continue to have that sort of brand connection with the consumer. And I think to what you just said too, is now they're trusted to some extent there, they can probably um, apply other suggestions or vertical or industries where they can maybe provide um, more monetization to that per, you know, from a lead aspect. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they're sort of controlling the conversation versus the brand. And I think maybe yeah. to your point, it is because, brands maybe have never done a real great job at it. I don't know. Yeah. And, um, and I think that's where the opportunity lies. So it's, that could be like the future of lead gen in a sense. Um, where it's, I, could, I don't think it could be called lead gen anymore. It'd just be like relationship building. Yeah. So imagine that you, you like companies work with you just cause you're a great relationship builder with people that aren't getting relationships built with. Um, well, that's, that's the dream of any brand or lead generator, right? That is that you have so much yeah. trust with this consumer. They, they just come for you for everything, you know? But there's no difference to B2B, right? I mean, yeah. like, and I think that, in fact, sorry, coming back to a point, that's another thing I've seen since 2005 is the sort of the blurring of B2B and B2C and it's, it's the sort of very, very similar. So now everyone talks about if you go on LinkedIn or anything like that, especially when you're a SaaS business and they just everyone markets you. So all I see is like people going like demand generation and whatever else. 
Yeah. It's actually very similar to lead generation. As much as I'll say it isn't because they're talking about B2B, when you look at B2C, um, it's very similar because it's all about relationship. Now, just look, watch the revenue. Watch the revenue. Don't concentrate on the amount of leads coming in. Watch the revenue go up. Um, and that's really what that's about. It's just because you're building relationships. And it, what is happening is you're building like trusted audiences and you're putting out all this content and everything else. And you know, slowly, slowly the revenue goes up. It's a similar sort of concept, I think, in, um, in B2C lead generation. Once you remove it from like, this is all, the only CPA opportunity that's going to happen is when this lead comes in, nothing else will ever happen in, like, unless this sale's made. The minute you stop looking at that and you look at the LTV of a lead, like you do in B2B, um, that's when you know, more of the budgets can start being put forward. You start realizing the relationship that you need to build with a person, not just go for like a one-hit wonder of trying to make a sale and stuff like that. So it's um, yeah, exactly like back to your point, it's an education process. It's just, it's really difficult to educate. And you know, I don't know if you work with any big brands and stuff, but it's difficult trying to get them to change. It's, it, well, it's not a it's, quick process either. Yeah, I mean, it's taken um, you know a dec over a decade for brands to understand um, the process uh, here in the U.S. Um, thank goodness we had a conference here called LeadsCon uh, that started. A friend of mine started thirteen, maybe fourteen years ago now. Uh, I'd have to do the math. Uh, thir I think it's thirteen years. Um, yeah, thirteen years ago, and that really did help bring you know, brands in and start really providing that education around, um, you know, best practices. And so it's taken a long time. And now brands, there are, are, are massive ones, you know, in, in specific sectors like insurance or, or mortgage or finance um, and others, uh, solar home services, you know, all these things that, that do understand um, lead management. And they do have, they've, they've sort of solved that sales and marketing conundrum of bringing them together. And um, understanding that they're working for a cost per sale a goal, uh, not just a cost per click or a cost per lead or, a, you know, cost per contact. They're, it all works towards cost per sale. Um, but it's taken a long time and there's still many companies that haven't sort of figured that out. And that's why I think it's, you know, interesting in the UK and Europe is that maybe, there, maybe it's a few years behind that evolution, right? Uh, brands need that education and they need that those examples to see, okay, this is how it's done. Um, that's why I'm actually really excited about lead generation world the, coming over there. Hopefully, you know, assuming the pandemic, this pandemic is settled down by April, but, you know, bringing um, them together to really talk about this sort of stuff to help grow the industry. So yeah, there are brands that I think that have figured it out, um, you know, but, but uh, it's, it's challenging because technology may not also be there, right? Um, you know, that was um, here, you know, there's a lot of lead management systems that sort of kind of came out and really helped. Um, and I think Databold sort of does that too, right? I mean, it helps those, those brands have a more efficient process of nurturing and working leads and creating leads. So those are all the, you know, pieces of, to the puzzle that continue to help this industry grow. And Databold's, I think, probably a really important piece of that puzzle. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's... Um... Yeah, I guess we are in some ways, maybe because funnily, we've got clients all over the world. So I get to see like different funnels and flows and how people work and everything. So in some ways, definitely. So for like a real quick example is when you do like ping post auction bids on uh, leads, you send like the zip code and whatever else over. Yeah, so that's big in the US, right? Like Bob do and like a few yeah. other companies do it. In the UK, like virtually no one, it's just, no one on earth does it. And the reason is, is you have to have the technology to bid, right? Like it doesn't work otherwise. Yeah. So nobody, like the, the it's most kind of, technology. It's complicated, right? It's a little, yeah, you know, it it's is, complicated. Yeah. But. yeah. but that, it's really interesting because that like transformed lead gen for a lot of people because it's suddenly like, hold on, we're just getting lead sent to us and we're always working on this like CPA. And so we have to discount all these leads we can't take as part of the CPA because we're going to have to pay for them anyway, even though we know that we might not convert them. Um, or have little chance of converting. You probably wouldn't buy them. You'd have it in for like a, a rejection reason. But um, once you get like that ping post auction, you actually get to bid on what you think the opportunity is, right? Um, and so it really helped like brands over here um, or agents and stuff. I just don't, it's just, I'm not entirely sure why. It just doesn't exist. 
Yeah, I think it's a tech thing. I think it's a, it's just an evolution of technology and building on top of it. And, you know, I mean, I, I think back to sort of the pink post when initially, you know, that was years ago, um, it, it first started in the insurance industry here. Mm-hmm. Um, and they would just ping, you know, aggregators would ping different people who are who's going to give them the highest bid on this data piece, right? Um, and then lead scoring sort of came in around that time and companies here started building lead scoring, you know, rules and metrics so they can score a lead based on the data and their likelihood of, you know, closing it based on the historical data that they've already closed, right? Which is, you know, fairly sophisticated as well. Um, but that sort of enabled companies to set the right bid buy the right leads, you know, all that sort of stuff for that ping post to work. But now, to be honest with you, I think it still takes place, but it's um, not quite as, uh, what's the word? Um, it's, it's not quite as accepted, at least from a regulatory standpoint. You know, yeah, US- I was going to say that could, be, that could be the issue is that when you start identifying like individuals out to 10 companies, it's... Yeah, um, you're, you're posting this data everywhere. It's, and, and, and it's just pieces of it. It's not the whole thing. It's usually yeah. not... Um, you know, personal identifiable information. Yeah. But at the same time, I know here the FTC and the regulatory, you know, federal government doesn't want data flying all around, you know, no matter what, yeah. you know, so. It's, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that'd be one of the issues. I guess you'd have to, you'd almost need like the lead scores in advance of the imposed people to like another system of the seller actually making the decision for them based on like, I don't know, dynamic CPL or something they get back. Um, well, yeah, I mean, to your, so, so that goes to the, uh, the, big, the next question in the evolution of brand success is, do you share your closed, uh, your, your own analytics with your partners, your, your lead sellers, right? Like, do you tell them what leads are good and which ones are bad? Or do you just tell them all the bad ones, you know? Yeah. So it's, I mean, it depends on the relationship that like a, a buyer has with their seller, right? So they, if they trust them and whatever else, I think the the biggest thing is that people are worried they're actually going to use it like against them in some way. So and if right. you've got a bunch of sales in one vertical, then uh, you're going to use it like a, a year later, a month later, or whatever, and resell it to one of their competitors or whatever else. Or raise or raise the price of the lead, right? Or raise like, the oh, price. Well, you're going to yeah. see I'm doing really good, and now I'm going to raise the price of the lead on you. Yeah. This is the thing of like working CPAs, which again comes down to transparency. Because if you know the CPA you're working to, this is you'd have this dynamic score, so everyone would know what the potential is within it. So it's it's really odd when you think about it. It's like two parties just don't trust each other quite a lot, but they have to work together uh, to do it. And to be honest, it's one of the things with Data Ball that we try and do is like aid this transparency, so everyone can log in and access and see what's going on, see sales. If you want them to, you can hide it see the reasons for rejections, what the performance is, how you, your performance benchmarks against other people. Obviously, you can't see their scores. Just do it as like an aggregate. Because um, really, that's just the way it should be. It should just be totally transparent. It's just that um, I think because lead gen is, like we were saying earlier, because it's, it's quite an easy market to enter now. You can have people that, like have bad intentions, enter it quite easily. They just get found out quite quickly, right? But it's all, everyone falls for the dream, like, you know, certain amount of leads or this price of leads, or I can get this many leads doing that. And it'll, you know, they end up like spoofing you or whatever. Um, yeah. But yeah. I think it's, I, I mean, there, I think you have to just like anything, you can't jump in right without testing the waters. And so, mm. you know, you have to have a trusted source, but when you have a partner that you've developed, you, you a brand has to share that information. If you want it to really yeah. grow and, 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 um, scale, I mean, that some of the largest companies here, like a quick in loans in the U S here are loan Depot. these are massive financial companies, you know, doing more, you know, tons of mortgage loans and buying thousands of mortgage leads on a daily basis are sharing information with their providers, telling them, Hey, here's what's working. Here's what's not working, you know? Yeah. Um, and they're, they're able to do that um, because they built trust. And what do they, what do they lead sellers do with it? Are they using it to like refine their audience? Or yeah. Are they, yeah. Yeah. They're so they all do media buying. Or they? 
yeah, yeah. The media are they doing all media okay so they're loading it back into facebook as an audience and whatever else. Yeah. well they, they yeah they could prop they could be doing that but they can more so be um optimizing what lead sources because right they're not just on facebook they're doing email they probably yeah. got about 20 affiliates running their campaigns they probably mm. are aggregating some too they, you know they got paid search keywords you know all those sorts of things they can identify based on the closed loans and 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 bringing it back to the source of that lead yeah exactly yeah and so that's what i was going to ask because if you like with media buying it's good just because you load it as an audience but then if you get the source for you running it through like a big affiliate network or something and you can apply it yeah. back to them yeah. um so yeah we do a similar sort of thing so you can like you said load load not just the sales but like all the event outcomes but we um started this machine learning program so the idea is it starts looking at what success is like um and then you attach an analytics program to that and starts actually telling you who you need to go for and um, whatever else. So not only could the uh, lead seller access that as part of the sales, but the lead buyer can actually see um, who their audience is when leads come in, how like they are to convert and things. Um, yeah. I mean, and just one other point though, too, Simon, is yeah. that you don't have to send the, the, the name and phone numbers and everything back no, to this. Right. To, you just it's sort of like it. a lead ID. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. yeah I, mean, I mean, that's, yeah, I, sorry. I always talk like this. I just, I always assume that's what everyone means to this. Oh, um, like philosophy is always send the absolute bare minimum of data yeah. you ever need to send anywhere. And there's usually a lead ID and an outcome at most. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's, that's really, that's all that's needed. Um, yeah. And that should be, uh, you should be willing to send that back to anybody. I think if you really want to continue to opt the marketing and Legion is optimization. I mean, mm. you know, whether it's landing pages or sources or it's ongoing optimi optimization too. If you've been in this industry long enough to know that there's nothing that you just plug and play. No, it's always right. like something's about ready to break mm. or something's going to do this or, you know, whatever it is. So um, you know, it's funny, really, though. I, I think, that, so. You, like you mentioned, the US in some, ter some ways is ahead in technology, but stuff like landing page design, it definitely isn't. I think it's like behind. It's is just, it? You see, yeah, you just see some awful, well, then maybe it's different, actually. It's more like garish, like, you know, less subtlety to it. I guess that's the point. Yeah, yeah, I, I'd, I'd be interested to see like, you know, what, com, you know, comparisons and I was actually going to ask you that, you know, about landing page, you, has landing page design or messaging or anything changed a uh, post COVID or like during this whole COVID thing? Or is it really sort of just stayed the same? You know, has messaging or anything like that changed a little bit that's working more so than others? Maybe I mean, that you see certain verticals change. I think that's the, so, you know, you go like, it'll shift into, so as soon as COVID kicked in, I'd like a bunch of our clients moved into, it sounds horrible. It's not, don't like moved into funeral plans yeah. and just went heavy on funeral plans and oh, yeah. you know, wills and life insurance yeah, but, and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Very positive. Um, about so I had yeah. people contact me and saying, what verticals can we <laughs> shift into? I'd be like, <laughs> funerals. Um, Oh my God. And then you saw, I saw a guy who, um, one of our clients actually, he just, and this was like, he's just unreal. He, within like three days of lockdown started, he sent me this landing page and what do you think of this? And it was, um, it was uh, driving insurance for car delivery drivers or delivery drivers for fast food. So it's like a real niche thing because at the time loads of people were being furloughed or being made redundant were shifting into it. And he did it like unbelievably, he's, you know, he's drove so much traffic to it just yeah. by, he was bidding in PPC and whatever. Um, so I think it's like any sort of lead generation. It's not, it, the messages are always changing. It's like reacting to this, being able to like move quickly and um, do it. And it's because it's advertising. I mean, it's, it's marketing and advertising and everyone does this. It's just like reacting to opportunities and things. Yeah. Um, uh, you, you yeah. along those same lines, you uh, you wrote an article on your LinkedIn, I think in March, about this is right when COVID, you know, w was hitting, about mm -hmm. how um, the lead gen sort of industry was going to lead the charge. I think uh, to some extent, and you know what what it was. Looking back at that article, um, you know, now do you think uh, you were right? Probably not. Uh, <laughs> 
Um, I was probably just like a piece of advert for someone to go, yeah, I do remember yeah, yeah. someone to go like, just read me, read me. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, well, um, I guess the, the greater point, the bigger question is, you know, how has, have you seen maybe the industry sort of navigate uh, the pandemic um, here? I mean, I, it's never been stronger. These Legion, I mean, they're, they're yeah, doing success, you know, very big success. I, I think it's less to do with COVID and more just to do with the recessions is like, you know, it's obvious that when furlough happened, the worst thing is, I mean, we like in general that we've not even felt anywhere near the worst, I suspect, of what's coming when like the furlough scheme in the UK, I don't think you've got a similar thing in the US. Um, and when the actual money has to start being paid back, <laughs> all these governments have spent, you know. Um, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we'll but see yeah, in a it's couple just, of years, right? Exactly. It, well, it depends who gets into administrations, right? So it might be after that. So Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it's more to do with that. It's just because recessions, um, what happens is everyone just pulls their budgets out of unknowns, which is like TV, you know, and radio and uh, I don't know, banners and whatever else where you're just paying on impressions Impression, effectively. Yeah. Um, and so I was actually wanting tangible results. Um, and the other thing is that it just it comes back to like the audience. You know, we were saying about Google and Facebook having a lot of the traffic um, that people are using, and even though there's affiliate, big affiliate networks, when you actually look back at their publishers, they all they all getting traffic from the same place. It's just within different niches that it's coming. Um, they've probably never been stronger either. I mean, there's lots of people sat at home searching the internet, so. I mean, it's, it's the thing, and you'll know this as well as I do, that um, it's just all about niches. I mean, that's all that happens with lead gen. It just goes, it's like trends. You just see the trends change. Um, so it, it does well, and the, the, when it's doing well is usually, um, yeah, when there's just more money going into it, which usually means there's money coming out somewhere else and being driven to it. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's just the niches that change, I think. Yeah, yeah. I was going to ask you earlier, earlier, but we, you know, got on to another thing. And I, I want to ask you because I think we have probably the same uh, definition. Um, but what is, what do you consider a lead? And I ask this, I know it sounds like a simple question, but um, you know, so many times when I talk with people here or in the UK, they, there's some different definitions of what an actual lead may be. Some think it's like mm. a data list. Uh, or is it somebody that's, you know, has more intent? What, what sort of, do you define a lead and lead generation? Yeah. So and for there's me, no right or wrong answer, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, a yeah, Nagachi sure. question. I just, you know, trying to sort of identify, you know, the perception of sort of lead gen and what a lead is. Yeah. From, you know, so, for, so for me personally, it means um, it's like a self-identified person who said, I want to be contacted about X. Um, so whatever that is, it could be, like um, a particular product could be a particular company. Um, but yeah, it's, I just see it as like pre-sale, not ready to quite make that leap just then. Um, and yeah, loads of intent. Um, and, uh, but I, you know, it's also seen in different ways. So the, like we call the data you mentioned where it's a list, we just call it list data. So yeah. Um, yeah, it's like old. Yeah, we data wouldn't call just, we wouldn't call that a you know, lead, you know, here too. No. But I, 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 sometimes I hear people talk about lead gen, and that's sort of what they're referring to is just sort of data, yeah. you know, which is it. Yeah, it's because it's um. I think in the UK, and I don't know if it's I don't think it's been the same in the US. I think it used to be in the past, and it's slowly changing here actually. But um, we just have huge call centers that a lot of brands would outsource to that were in like high sale um, growth stages, I guess, or just used to high sales. And what would happen is, um, it comes back to like the earlier point is, so let's say you've got a thousand seats in a call center and they just need data. Depending on what the product is, it's really difficult to generate that many leads, right? Like mm -hmm. if it's a high intent sort of thing. Um, so what they do is just buy list data and they, plumb it into the agents. They give each agent, I don't know, 30, 40 records an hour of this list data. And then they look for them to make 
one sale every two hours, one sale every three hours, whatever it is. Um, and that and there's still a lot of call centers in the UK that work like that. The yeah. difference is that under GDPR, the opt-ins of the data like obviously got a lot more stringent. So they, the, the company that they're calling on behalf of has to be like a name brand that they're doing. Yeah. So this, is, this has been happening for years. So they, literally years ago, we used to say to people, um, there's a few problems here. So number one is like the agents are completely and utterly demoralized. Imagine sitting there all day, every day, and then you're making, like your success is like w- once every three hours if you're lucky. <laughs> And all the rest of it is just someone slamming the phone down on you, slamming the phone down. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, and it wouldn't matter, like, you know, if it's not particularly high to get item, these people are really well, uh, really low paid, you know, not getting a lot of money. Um, so what happens is they, it sort of compounds itself. So they they start performing even worse than they would do like normally because they're so demoralized. Um, and it just comes back to the same thing. There's a CPA and the CPA is all going into the call center because they have to hire that many agents to hit a sales volume that they've just bought really cheap data or list, give it in there and just got millions of agents dialing it. And that's why if you reverse that and start looking at the leads, like why don't you get really high intent people that want to convert? You could probably lose, depending on, I don't know the exact numbers, but let's say 90% of the agents to end up with 100 you move the CPA into the quality of the leads and they're making a sale like one in every four dials that they're doing. Um, it just transforms it. And the, the other thing that happens is when you, if, so we always have these periods in those call centers, they call it like filler. So they still have to, you know, have the agents being active because otherwise right. it's just wasted hours. They actually start performing on the lower um, tier data anyway. So it brings the whole thing up. I mean, we see it all the time. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, it can just be tough. It's, I, is it an education thing? It's just like the priority of the CPA. It's really weird. I, you know, like I almost, the words coming out of my mouth, I just feel like it's Groundhog Day because I go on about it all the time. <laughs> so it just, for me, seems really obvious because I just keep saying the same it things. Is, it like, is obvious. You know, sales and marketing are siloed. That's the problem. And where are you going to put a CPA? Yeah. That's the other problem. Yeah, no, it is um, obvious. It is obvious. Um, and I'm sort of shocked to hear companies aren't, are, are still running that way, to be honest with you. It's crazy. Yeah. It's, uh, so yeah, there's a lot that are, it's, it's usually, it's not the brands themselves doing it. It's when they outsource the sales that yeah. usually happens to the call centers. So it's not, don't get me wrong, not all of them do it, but um, yeah, a lot do. Well, good. So I, I appreciate, you know, identifying, you know, sort of what a lead is and it's not a data list, you know, and it's not, um, you know, cause I can sit, there's, there's certainly different levels of intent with a lead, right? Um, mm. I think that's fair, but I think a, a, a lead is somebody that rose, you know, rose their hand and said, yes, I want this product. And there's a certain level of int- intent there. Um, yeah. it's not a, it's not necessarily a co-reg thing. It could be depending on how they raise their hand and all this sort of stuff. But I think, um, if we're focusing on high intent leads, you know, people that really came to a landing page, filled it out, no, knew what they were doing, um, and what product they were going to be and what was going to happen. I think that's, you know, at its core, what, where the lead gen industry really thrives because brands can, um, you know, rely on their partners to help them scale, um, not just their own brand, but, you know, like you said, the lead generators have their own brands, right? So now you've got Mm -hmm. really two brands working for one and they can do this multiple times with lead. And I think that's sort of the, the key success, um, with the Legion Legion industry and how they can sort of partner together to scale um, a single brand or business. Um, um, so yeah, no, I, I just kind of curious cause I, I hear, you know, people talk about Legion. I go, well, that's not the Legion I know, you know, uh, just data is not really Legion, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think it sort of comes back to people, doesn't it? It's, um, so I, I think that's, the other big thing of lead gen that gets missed or a lot of people recognize this is um, there was no point like abusing people that, that, you know, don't want yeah. to be spoken to or don't want to be contacted by people. I mean, it's the whole point is the success should be the measurement of, uh, of, for me, the success of lead gen is the amount of people that you don't piss off. You know, like, yeah. So by contacting them and that it usually means it's high quality. <laughs> You're not going to have complaints. Um, 
and uh, they actually want to hear from you. And then, and then, you know, that's why some like digital marketing or performance marketing can have a bad name because a lot of it's been um, like spray and pray. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's, you know, it's still a lot of that that goes on, like we were saying with the call center. But in reality, just, you know, these are people. And that's, I think, why I, my, I now think of it a bit more like B2B. Like, I don't sit, like, approaching people on LinkedIn all day, every day, going, like, come and work with me, come and work with me, or sending lists out. I just wouldn't do it because I know they'd say no. Um, and I think the same sort of philosophy has to apply to people. You know, we're in 2020. It's like an educated market. There's just literally no point in going for the spray and pray option anymore. It might, you know, in the very short term, you might reap some benefits from it. But really, the future is about, like, brands and the ones that develop strong relationships with their customers. You know, you look at all the big brands that, you know, if I say words to you, like trainers, the certain brands that you think of, and it's because of the relationship they have and the story that they have with their consumers. And really that's what lead gen's about. It comes back to the nurturing thing, like tying up sales and marketing and turning these people into evangelists of your company because they came in as a lead. I mean, they made that leap. Now make that leap with them and turn them into someone that loves your company. Um, and that's why I see lead gen as. Yeah, no, that's great. So let, that's a good segue. It just for the last uh, few minutes, cause I'm sure you got to go, but the, uh, I want to get into data bowl a little bit again. Um, you guys yeah. have that sort of nurturing component into in data bowl that sort of helps turn, be more than just a, you know, piece of data, right? I mean, you get to follow mm. up, you have nurturing campaigns. Can you tell me a little bit about the features? I know there's SMS in there. Um, you know, how are yeah, we sure. sort of utilizing it to, continue to communicate and nurture a lead yeah so i guess right from the origination so in date the idea the whole idea of data as i said is you, it's like a one-stop shop that you can do everything with right so it's a fully integrated lead gen machine so you can build the landing pages so you control all the assets that are actually like the cold face that a prospect or a person would see um all the tracking's built in so you can see instantly what affiliate, the source, everything. And then um, we've got loads of validation. I think probably we've got more validation in Datable than anything else as in any other lead gen machine. But what's great about that, it's not really to like, I mean, yeah, you want to reject fraud, right? That's the ultimate aim. But if you're like media buying, so Facebook and PPC, the fraud isn't actually that bad. That isn't the killer. It's the people that like put incorrect details in. You're missing out on those. That's why you want front end validation on the form so that they don't mistype things. You're working with affiliates. I mean, yeah, the fraud is huge. I see tons of it. It's like 50% fraud, I would say. It's massive. Um, yeah. And it's bots. It's mainly bots. So validation, you know, the bots are too sophisticated to put fake details in. It's 100% legit. The IP address matches absolutely everything. So you have other ways. So we use that as well. So I think you were talking to um, the guys at Conversant few weeks ago that I saw. So yeah, we work with them because you can imagine there's like the network they have, so they can be subjects to quite a lot of fraud. So we work with them with stopping that um, like bot fraud. So we stop all that like nasty stuff there, build the form, the lead comes in and then you can API it off to like anything. So um, yeah, we send it into Salesforce, Marketo, we send it to like G sheets for certain people and they work and we wouldn't do that don't say that do don't, not g sheets not g <laughs> in the u.s I, in the u.s everyone does it this is why when you said to me you were behind i was like oh come to I, a lot I of these, these people that are using google sheets or spreadsheets i don't know about i don't know, I don't know. These <laughs> but so you know it goes off to anything anyway and yeah, then yeah, yeah, yeah. based on outcomes coming back um yeah start nurturing it so we'd like send the email sequences off sms sequences and it's really trying to take the conversation if it's um, offline that you're sending to, so like a call center, bring it back online or communicate them in a different way and keep this sort of like relationship going. Not in a way to annoy someone. What you're actually trying to do is um, either like get them through to a sale with the thing that they actually wanted to hear about and they might not want to convert online, but it's also just building this trust. It's, you know, it's that old adage of like the sale never happens on the first call. It takes the 12th call or whatever. But really like, in 2020, it's like, it could be every medium that you can contact someone with. Um, so then we deliver it and then we take the outcomes um, back and then we can, you know, start this nurturing process again of whether it's cross selling to other things, just keeping people like aware of your um, brand or your products or whatever. Um, but yeah, that's really the aim is that like an entire performance marketing suite or arsenal 
um, in one machine. Because currently, and you'll know this, is typically like lots of disparate technology right. be, gets used. So people use like a landing page builder, they'll use like um, has offers or some other tracking software. Yep. They use like a lead distribution system or send it to G Suite. Um, <laughs> and then, um, you know, by the time, and then you need another bit of software to like knit all that together, like Zapier or something. And then you need something else to report on it or like Tableau. So before you know it, you've got five, six different bits of technology to, to deliver, to collect a lead and deliver it all in one. Um, yeah. So I've done this, right? I mean, that's part of the reason why I'm sitting there like, you know, how many years ago, six, seven years ago, going like, this is absolutely insane. Like, I don't want to sit here having to learn all this technology, having to pay for all this technology, having all these support teams, and having to bring other people in that can look after different things. I just want to do it all in one. Yeah. So obviously there's probably, a, you know, really a, a million things that you could continue to build into Datable, right? There's probably like, yeah. you probably have a long list in that office of going, what, you know, wish, a wish list of all the things that you mm. want to build in there. But is one of them to maybe uh, potentially bring in more of the sales management? So, you, you know, you talked about going to Google Sheets, whatever they do with it once it goes there, but Salesforce or whatever, you know, bringing in maybe so that a salesperson can log in, get that lead, know when to call it. Uh, um, you know, have that sort of functionality maybe in there too. So it lives all within one system. It doesn't necessarily have to, you know, go out to a sales force. They can do the CRM. We call it LMS here. Yeah, CRM. Yeah. yeah, you know, here. Yeah, no, we call it the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, yeah. I mean, see, that's a lot, right? But yeah, to build. It's, so I, I get people calling us like a jack of all trades already, right? Yeah. So it's like something I get used to against me, but, and my counter to that is, but it's all just one thing. Like, you know, what's actually happened is people have just got used to using tons of technology to do just one thing. Um, in reality, you just want one thing. Um, in terms of the CRM, I mean, we've got like a rudimentary one currently, so you could actually log in and put like an outcome against the lead. It's not like, you know, in HubSpot or Salesforce, you can see a picture and sit there typing tons of notes. But yeah, I think it's a, it could be a good point um, whether we close the loop and actually take care of the entire sales process. Yeah, I mean, there's triggers, you know, all those sorts of things, right? Lee comes in, goes to this person over here, uh, you know, they have to call it, then maybe an email, automated email goes out, estimate, you know, all those little triggers that goes down the funnel. Yeah. Um, I mean, we, do, we can do that now, but like you said, it's, it's just, if you're like doing the actual sale, you yeah. ne wouldn't necessarily um, work on Datable to configure it. But yeah, I think um, so what if are you we were to... on now? Uh, I mean, it's just so <laughs> endless. <laughs> so currently, um, we do all the landing page design in Datable, for example. So um, I've got like a team of designers and front-end developers um, who are brilliant at like conversion rate optimization. Um, and one of the things that we will be launching shortly is we've just built like a drag and drop builder. So if you log into Datable currently, it's like a HTML editor. So it's brilliant. If you're a designer or a front end developer, they love it, right? Because it's like you can endlessly customize everything and do whatever you want. But if you're a novice user, um, it's, you know, it's just baffling. But th there's a count to that as well, which is when you're a novice user, like even with a drag and drop builder, you typically make it look bad. <laughs> I sit looking at these landing pages all day going, like, what on earth is that? Um, so, yeah, that's something we work on. Um, we have all this machine learning stuff that we're um, sort of integrating, or some brands are integrating into their campaigns, which is this idea of um, when a lead comes in, we can start to make decisions about how likely it is actually to convert. But then that can also be based on the sales information coming back to like a CRM idea. So if it's going into a dialer, like know the specific type of individual or the individual that should call them at what specific time, the message they could lead with and stuff like that. And that what's interesting is you only see like small percentages, right? Difference. Um, but those small percentages, when you're operating, I don't know, on like a 25 grand a day budget of buying leads every year add up to a massive amount. Um, and a big thing that we're constantly working on is just the UI. I mean, um, so a lot of the functionality that you need to sort of carry out, like all the stuff we've been talking about is, is there and you can do it all, but 
it's like trying to bring that a bit more to life to people um, and figure out how they're going to interact with it and how we can remove clicks and work with them and um, or, yeah, they can just navigate around the system a bit better. Um, and a bit like lead gen, it never ends. It can always be better. We sort of, you know, shift yeah. focus on different things. Um, but it's, yeah, it's what we love doing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's a whole other podcast, right? Is how to manage a tech company development, the process of yeah. what's next, you know, uh, keeping things moving along, not getting backed up on projects that aren't mean, you know, <laughs> that's a, that's a whole other yeah. challenge, you know? Yeah. But it's, uh, that's the beautiful thing about it. It's like, it's still sort of, because I, the strange thing is I do, I love lead gen and purely because I like looking at, um, flows and stuff like that. I just love, you know, like trying to yeah. figure out what's going to work and what isn't. But the same sort of applies to the technology. So when we stop doing lead generation, we still do a bit now for a couple of enterprise clients, but like we completely removed from actually doing it ourselves. Um, but I, you know, I get to work with other companies sort of figuring stuff out with them. And um, that's the great thing about them, like this integrated system is that we pretty much contain everything in it. So they don't have to leave and we can create all these like wonderful and uh, amazing journeys that uh, their prospects and people go through and the way we deliver it and things. Um, and if they want to find out like more, they just go to, uh, just, is it just databull.com? Yeah, just go to uh, databull.com, um, drop me an email, just simon at databull.com. Cool. Um, yeah. Great. It's the best way to get in contact. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I think we could probably keep talking shop for another, you know, hour, but we'll, I'll, I'll let you, uh, let you go. I know it's late over there. Um, I appreciate you joining though. And, uh, you know, I look forward to, um, talking with you about getting involved in lead generation world too, in, in April. I mean, I think this conversation is what needs to be sort of the, at the forefront, right? Is, is how do we continue to bring and build trust and transparency, um, in the industry so that, uh, we can all succeed and grow together. So, um, I appreciate the conversation. Um, thanks for joining me and, uh, you know, I'll be in touch. Yeah, it's been a blast. Thanks, Mike. All right. Thanks, Simon.